Um, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce the next two moderators, uh, Dr. Scott Takoti from the University of Washington and Eric Yonash from MD Anderson. I'm gonna turn it over to you two gentlemen. Great. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for being here and thank you so much for, uh, uh, to the speakers for, for us uh, to start this uh, second session, uh, which is uh, called um, Tumor Evolution and, and Mechanisms of Lethality. So, you know, one of the, uh, one of the big questions here really is, is, you know, renal cell carcinoma, whether it's clear cell or non-clear cell renal cell carcinoma, we, we know from studies like Tracer X what the initiating genomic factors are, but functionally really understanding how this disease initiates, what are the features that really uh, confer lethality, and then how is it that we actually interact with these, these various tumor-specific features, I think are critical questions for the field. Um, it's, it's not immunology, but I think it is fundamental to our understanding. So uh, we've got four amazing speakers here that uh, are going to go through various aspects of these questions. And uh, Scott Tycote, who's an associate uh, professor at University of Washington and at the Fred Hutch, um, is going to introduce our speakers. Very good. Uh, thank you, Eric, and thank you for the, the um, uh, program committee to invite me to be here. And I'm excited about our session. Uh, four speakers, three here in person, and one will be a virtual presentation. So let me introduce uh, Dr. Robert Satcher. Uh, Dr. Satcher is an associate professor in the Department of Orthopedic Oncology at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. And he's going to be presenting his talk, uh, Targeting the Osteogenic Niche for Preventing Kidney Cancer Bone Metastasis Progression. Okay, thank you very much. Get this up, okay. Uh, just uh, wanted to thank uh, the for for the invitation to come and speak about uh, bone metastasis and kidney cancer. I think we're probably one of the few uh, talks today on that. And uh, just as an orthopedic oncologist, um, we know that uh, we're seeing more and more of these patients. Um, in fact, it's the number one uh, type of metastatic lesion that we operate on now at MD Anderson, head of breast and prostate. So um, our group has, of course, focused on what happens once kidney cancer cells reach the osteogenic niche and um, uh, have the good fortune of working with a number of collaborators, including Sue Paulin, who uh, has done a lot of work on uh, prostate uh, bone metastasis, um, Sean Zhang at Baylor, and Teresa Geis, who have done a lot of work on breast cancer. And we began thinking about what are the differences between kidney cancer, bone mats, um, which produce these highly osteolytic lesions, what kind of interactions are happening in the uh, bone microenvironment. In fact, it does have some uh, parallels with multiple myeloma in terms of interacting with osteoblasts and osteocytes, as I'll get into. But um, uh, we realized that we needed a better model and uh, this is some of the work done by uh, my colleague, Dr. Chan Hong Tan. Look, uh, basically uh, starting with a parental cell line, intracardiac injection and isolating the uh, bone cells, which we um, re-injected in order to get a uh, bone tropic uh, cell line, which is highly bone tropic and cre recreates these uh, highly lytic lesions in bone, as you can see. Um, and when we looked at these histologically uh, to look at what the osteoclast activity was, in fact, the uh, renal cell line has much less trap staining, which looks at the uh, osteoclast activity than for instance, prostate cancer and uh, breast cancer cell lines. So that got us thinking about, are they having the same sort of interactions with osteoclast or, uh, in arriving at this kind of scenario in patients, or in fact, is it uh, interactions on the anabolic side in bone with osteoblasts and osteocytes? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't have to look over my shoulder. But um, okay, so our, our working hypothesis centers around this um, that there's this sort of initial pre osteolytic phase where uh, the kidney cancer cells are interacting with uh, bone cells, osteoblasts, osteocytes, and this uh, triggers later 
a more progressive osteolytic phase. So, in fact, when we um, uh, use condition medium with uh, the kidney cancer, or excuse me, with um, osteoblasts, we saw a profound effect in inhibition of uh, the mineralization and the maturation of osteoblast, as uh, you can see. And when we uh, did the proteomic, proteomics on the secretome, uh, there was one uh, molecule, big H3, that you can see there that was secreted higher than any other uh, molecules. And that, in fact, was unique to the cell line. And you can see that in comparison with other uh, cell lines. So big H3, or uh, transforming growth factor beta induced, is a 68 kilodalton protein. Um, it's encoded by the TGFBI gene, which is in fact downregulated in melareostosis, which is known as, some of you uh, know as melting bone disease, um, which is a hyperostosis. It's also a negative prognostic factor in renal cell carcinoma, and that stands in contrast to breast and prostate uh, cancer. And it binds uh, to collagens and also to cells, so thought to play a role in those interactions. And when we knock down big H3, it does reduce uh, osteolysis, uh, the degree of osteolysis in, in these lesions. We also have begun collecting um, bone metastasis samples from patients, and we have over 130 samples collected. And big H3 is very highly expressed in these bone metastasis uh, lesions, over 95% of the samples. So that got us, again, taking a deeper look in bone to see what was um, happening. And uh, we started collaborating with uh, Dr. Leon Wong at uh, University of Delaware, looking at what's going on. And we uh, saw very striking changes in the architecture of the bone, where um, a lot of empty lacunae, where the osteocytes live, and you can kind of see a cartoon representation of what that network looks like. Um, and in fact, there is a high degree of uh, apoptosis, as you can see with the human bone samples here. So transitioning to in vitro, working with Mary Farrak Carson, who's also in Houston uh, with an in vitro model, which recreates this osteocyte network when we grow osteocytes in a 3D hydrogel. And again, where we were able to reproduce this um, apoptosis when exposing to big H3 and to conditioned medium. So we verified this in the uh, hydrogels, looking at co-culture also with uh, renal cancer cells, conditioned medium, and seeing that this uh, effect is reversed, in fact, in, in the knockdown um, cell line case. So um, in vitro in our mouse model, one of the interesting things that we found, and I wanted to uh, focus your attention there, is that regionally in the bone uh, is where uh, the apoptosis occurs. So as you uh, can look at the same bone and move further down in that bone, you see less apoptosis, which is shown on the right there. This is a right versus left side in a mouse. So uh, the contralateral bone, where of course there's less apoptosis. And that got us to thinking about, again, what sort of interactions are going on um, and how those interactions are disturbed. Osteocytes form gap junctions with other osteocytes and also have hemichannels. And when uh, we looked at uh, connexin 43, uh, which forms gap junctions in hemichannels in, in these cells, uh, it in fact is downregulated in, in response to big H3, which is also reproduced um, in our 3D hydrogel. So functionally, we see uh, less communication between the cells. And again, this is in hydrogels, um, a, a dye transfer assay. So uh, where we are with this is basically focusing on this pathway and also trying to understand um, what's happening with the epigenetics, particularly with the uh, renal cells when they are in bone. It's a, a different type of constraint being in the bone microenvironment. And we're wondering whether or not they um, progress in the same way as cells do in the primary tumor. So I'm going to end it there because I think I'm out of time. Thank you.
questions for Dr. Satcher? Johnny. So I'll just repeat, I'll repeat the question. Uh, the question is, is the genotype affecting the phenotype in the bone in, in renal cell carcinoma? Uh, excellent question. And uh, the, the short answer is no, we don't know yet. Uh, we've uh, worked with one cell line so far, and that is uh, you know, sort of the next set of questions that we're asking. Well, um, the question was comparing uh, the cell line with the M1 and M2, and uh, the answer again is that is something that we very much uh, are in the process of doing, and um, because we agree that uh, is this more a product of the uh, bone microenvironment, or is this a product of you know the genomics of the cells which are introduced there? Um, our thoughts are that it's probably some of both, but um, yeah, it, it's um, something that we think is fairly complex because it's um, trying to understand what are all the interactions between you know, all of the different cell types. And we've only um, looked at osteoblasts and osteocytes. Obviously there's other cell types in the bone microenvironment that could be playing a uh, significant role also. Dr. Satcher, there's an online question. Uh, let me ask, uh, Dr. Olivia Lombardi asks that the 786 cell line uh, has a truncated HIF-1, so it's a HIF-2 dominant uh, cell line. And do you think HIF-2 may have a role in RCC survival in the bone metastatic niche? Um, don't know the answer, but uh, um, we'd, we'd have to, uh, again, we know that uh, uh, this cell line, of course, does have that mutation. And um, we haven't actually uh, specifically looked at whether or not if we modulate that, uh, it changes the, the phenotype of these cells. Mm -hmm. um, Question over here. First off, I just want to say thank you for, for coming. This is great every day on the Nation Online Launch Tour. And thank you for coming because it's so refreshing to get the perspective of an orthopedic surgeon um, that's doing this sort of work. And I think that multidisciplinary work when we're looking at RCC is great because it's sort of actually like the amount of tissue that you consider surgical procedures for us, to, like for us as a community to be able to insert and make analyze is huge. So have you looked at that? Have you looked at the specimens that have been derived from the large body of work that you did, especially that you've done to kind of characterize that? I think that's what's lacking in the field is the molecular characterization of the bone, the bone tumor itself and how it's different than like the primary and our like the city on the tissue. <laughs> Well, we are um, very excited about this and um, obviously have a, kind of a, a group of collaborators at MD Anderson, which um, we're trying to, of course, uh, focus on this. Um, we are you know, trying to create additional uh, models that we can propagate, PX models, et cetera, um, to, to take closer look at all of these questions. and. You know, we're sort of, we're on the front end of this, which is why, unfortunately, I don't have as many answers as I would like to have. But um, hopefully when we come back in future years, we'll have a lot more answers uh, because, yeah, we, we realize that this is very valuable material. Very good. Thank you. I think in the interest of time, um, we'll move forward uh, to our next speaker. Um, so let me introduce Dr. Lucas Salas. Dr. Salas is an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology, uh, the Dartmouth College School of Medicine. And the title for his talk uh, this morning, Epigenetic Modifications of Cytosines in Clear Cell Kidney Carcinogenesis and Survival. Thank you, Dr. Kai. 
Well, uh, first of all, I want to introduce you a little bit about what I do in my lab. So I work mostly on cell heterogeneity. And why cell heterogeneity? When you think about any kind of response that we have, infection, uh, hypoxia, we're thinking about adaptations in the different cell types. And when we think about those adaptations, this adaptation and specifically the cell identity are regulated mostly through these epigenetic marks. So this model that we have on top of this slide is representing that cell heterogeneity in terms of the development of the cell and how we just roll down that slope and we generate different lineages. When we think about that hierarchy, for instance, using blood, we have that from one multipotent progenitor, we can develop myelot lymphoid lineages and we can develop several other things. When we think about the kidney, we have three different lineages that are interacting here. So we have the rhetoric part that is just mostly the collecting part. We have the metanetwork networks that is generating all the glomeruli and all the uh, proximal tubules. And then we have all the stroma that is just generating that response to the hypoxia or that pseudo hypoxia. So for this project specifically, uh, what the central hypothesis is that in the middle of all these very complex uh, genetic and uh, transcriptional landscape that we have in the, in the clear cell renal cell carcinoma. What we are trying to focus is specifically on this little circle and that star that is uh, pointed at that blue arrow. So when you have that pseudo hypoxia and specifically when you have that changes with the VHL, you can find that there are some dysregulation at the level of the chromatin in which we could have an activation of the 10 to 11 translocases generating changes to the levels of 5 hydroxymethylcytosine and 5 methylcytosine. So there are cytosine modifications that could be associated to that progression. And specifically, this is something that, uh, that differential DNA methylation versus hydroxymethylation uh, could be very important and relevant for these tumors. In addition, we want to interrogate if these are associated with changes in patient survival and the associations to gene expression. And why this is important. So if we go back to 2018 with the, uh, this TCA analysis of clear cell renal cell carcinoma, there were these two specific CPG sites on the DKK1 and SFRP1, in which uh, in the heat map on those little red circles, those are specifically two sites that are on the first exon of these genes. However, if we look at the whole gene, there are multiple different things that are appearing at the same time when we are compared to normal versus the tumor. And uh, this representation is actually showing us uh, differences, for instance, in this CPG island methylator phenotype for this uh, clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Uh, one important thing is that when we are interrogating uh, these five methylcytosine changes, we are mixing at the same time all the different changes on the cytosines. And uh, the reason for this specific project that we have is try to separate what is happening with the 5 methylcytosine versus the 5 hydroxymethylcytosine. And why uh, that could be interesting to interrogate. The 5 methylcytosine is very constant, constant across the different uh, lineages and the different cell types. We have a small but important proportion that are uh, similar between the different tissues. However, for the 5 hydroxymethylation, we have that uh, they are mostly concentrated on the central nervous system and the kidney cancer. We know also that we have a specific features that are related to the methylcytosine. And interestingly, for the 5 hydroxymethylation, when we look between the changes between repression that we could have for the uh, DNA methylation for the hydroxymethylation, it could be that these alterations could actually antagonize that DNA methylation features or could be related more to the fidelity of that DNA methylation from one generation to another. And that could be interesting also for the tumor. Also, it also promotes transcription and pluripotency in more embryonal cells. So currently we are working on the bioinformatic pipeline. This is just a proof of concept from our pilot data. Uh, this is the actual distribution that we have on top. This is the 5 methylcytosine. So we have extremes. We have either hypomethylation, hypermethylation. For the 5 hydroxymethylcytosine, there's 
that little peak that we see at the very beginning, because again, it is a small proportion of the, of the genome that has this marker. But interestingly, what we want to try is to look at the information that we retrieve is high quality, and we can try to process not only what is happening with only the genetic mark, but how is that representing changes at the level of the transcription. In addition, when we are using 5-methylcytosine, we can interrogate the tumor heterogeneity, which is important too. So uh, we have specific pipelines. This is something that my student Sishan is working. And uh, with that, we are doing this hierarchical model that is based on several other discoveries in the last five years, in which we are trying to separate that stromal component from all the immune cells. And that could be represented here, for instance, with the TCGA data, but also with our own data. Further, we are also trying to uh, accumulate information also from the networks between what is happening with the cytosine modifications and the gene expression for the whole RNAc and the small RNAc. And specifically, just as an example, for instance, on the top, we can see that for this uh, uh, INSIC1, that is an insulin sensitive gene, uh, for the 5 methylcytosine, we have some specific changes that are represented by that red line, especially if you look on the US browser on, to, on the bottom, uh, which are more closer to the actual gene that we are trying to interrogate. These are distal enhancers. But when we look at the 5 hydroxymethylcytosine, the changes are much more distal. They are on the, on the south shelf, so they are very, very distal. But these could represent changes that are related to that dynamic that we have. Further, if we look at the results from TCGA data for the protein atlas, we can see that there, there are differences in survival between this lower versus high expression for this specific gene. This is just an example, but what are the next steps? So for this week, we have already 44 samples that are being arrayed, but there are another 150 samples that are pending from our uh, kidney cancer um, tumor biobank. Uh, we are trying to just generate something that is a very balanced uh, sample that we can interrogate different things about stage, grades, age, and sex. And there's a specific subset in which we are trying also to interrogate some single cell information. Uh, this will just help us to understand more that kind of uh, heterogeneity that we can face. And this is uh, unpolished data. This is actually some of the six samples that we have from our uh, tumor cancer biobank that are also overlapping some of our uh, DNA mutilation data. As you can see there's a very interesting clustering in there. And finally, well, I just want to thank all my collaborators and all that uh, complex network without all the different researchers and the funding, it would be impossible to do this. Do you have any questions? I think we have time for a few questions. Yeah, right on. So uh, you saw that you want to Yes, that's that, that that's correct, and that's specifically like the hypothesis that they have initially with this TCGA data. Uh, nevertheless, again, this is just looking at one specific CPG site. Right. And okay. that could be more, much more complex. Right. How? Yeah, follow up question would be that uh, once now our uh, pets, how that later on, and if that's uh, being drawn to it, that's more predictable. Yes, it, this is very important. So if we think about like the graph showing the different proportions for kidney, uh, Actually, we observe that there is a moderate level of this 5 hydroxymethylation. So actually, the TEDs are actually present in normal kidney. And uh, how that interacts here in this very different metabolic environment that we have with the tumor that is actually generating all these oncometabolites that are also activating this TED. Uh, it, it's it's part of the of the question that we have here in this project.
Yes. Um, do you find the uh, methylation affects the expression of the endogenous retroviruses, the ERVs, and presentation of that antigen? That's a very good question. That's something that we, we will be interrogating here. Um, there are uh, there, there, there are ways that we can interrogate specifically this area of retroviruses. Uh, when we are doing these um, more microarray based, uh, that's, uh, that's something that bioinformatically requires a little more work because it's not just one single region that you're looking at but several regions that are sparse across all the genome. But in other tumors, we have seen some, some changes that could be interesting, yes. Yeah, enjoyed your talk. Um, there's been recent work about epigenetic memory that epithelial cells, for example, after infection or allergic inflammation, hold memory that may impact future immune responses. I just was curious if you think that that might be what you're observing here in your epithelial cells. That's a very interesting question. And actually that's part of the, of the reason why we are trying to interrogate more about this tumor heterogeneity. Uh, usually, um, so uh, most of my work is related to, to cell deconvolution. And I've worked mostly with blood usually. But when we are thinking about the solid tissues, uh, the, the answer to get that deconvolution and to get that heterogeneity or that memory is trickier to interrogate from the bioinformatic point of view. Um, and I believe that will require a little bit of collaboration between more basic scientists and myself, because uh, if we are able to really get to those uh, memory to say, or to those lineages and try to interrogate that heterogeneity will help us to disentangle and to get that piece of the puzzle that we want here. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, two more minutes. Let me ask you uh, real quick, a, a more general question um, from when you feel that about uh, HERV, but genome's a big place. Uh, so when you start looking at these methylation differences, do you have certain pathways or genes of interest that you expect to focus on uh, as you move forward with your research? Yes, uh, initially, there are a specific pathways that we are interested. However, for the first question that we want, we want to go a little more general, just to generate additional hypotheses. Uh, and the reason for that is that we do not want to be into conservative to lose something more. So we are trying to push the boundaries here a little bit. And that's the reason why we try to, to be more comprehensive. Uh, of course, uh, the traditional genes and the traditional pathways that we are interrogating are important. And specifically all, everything that is related to the metabolism here that is more closely related to that pet relationships that we want to. Yeah. yeah. Very good, thank you. Let's uh, move forward. Our next speaker um, is participating with us virtually. Um, so hopefully we're ready to go with Dr. Olivia Lombardi. Uh, she's a postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory of Dr. Peter Radcliffe at the University of Oxford and will presenting uh, her talk this morning, uh, the title analysis of transcriptional profiles during the evolution of clear cell RCC from pre-malignant to malignant lesions. Hi everyone, can you see my screen and my pointer? We can, yes. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk today. I'm sorry I can't be there in person due to travel restrictions, but hopefully I'll be able to attend uh, next year. So as I'm sure you all know, inactivation of the VHL tumor suppressor gene is a hallmark of clear cell kidney cancer and its normal function is to negatively regulate HIF-1 alpha and HIF-2 alpha transcription factors, which we collectively refer to as HIF. So in normal conditions, the VHL protein targets HIF for degradation. However, um, 
when VHL is inactivated, as is the case in clear cell kidney cancer, HIF becomes stabilized and it can then bind to DNA and upregulate its target genes. And this is known to be a key driver of clear cell kidney cancer. Having said that, um, HIF target genes are involved in diverse cellular processes, including some which are tumor promoting and some which are tumor suppressive. So the biological consequences of HIF activation um, are context dependent and HIF activation in a cell may not necessarily have an oncogenic, out oncogenic outcome. So consistent with that, while VHL inactivation seems to be required for clear cell kidney cancer tumor genesis, it in itself generally doesn't seem to be sufficient. So there's several lines of evidence that support that, including when you do um, mathematical modeling of driver mutations in clear cell kidney cancer, whilst VHL inactivation occurs at the earliest stages of tumor initiation, there seems to be a long latency between VHL inactivation and formation of the aggressive tumor. And so um, we want to know how these, these um, how the cells with inactivated VHL and activated HIF progress from this benign pre-malignant stage to the malignant stage. Since I previously mentioned that, um, that HIF target genes include some that regulate both oncogenic and tumor suppressive cellular processes, it could be that the HIF target gene repertoire is being shifted away from tumor suppressive target genes and more towards oncogenic target genes. And so generally revealing the changes in gene expression that occur during this progression from pre-malignancy to malignancy should help reveal the genes that are truly driving the onset of clear cell kidney cancer. So ideally to study this, we would like to um, obtain patient samples and compare gene expression profiles of pre-malignant and malignant cells. However, in most cases of clear cell kidney cancer, we're not able to do this because the, um, the tumor samples which we're able to get already have, um, although they have inactivated VHL, they've already progressed to malignancy. On the other hand, individuals with VHL syndrome have one allele of the VHL gene inactivated in their germline. And this can often lead them to be predisposed to clear cell kidney cancer because VHL, or VHL is completely inactivated in, uh, more frequently and in more cells. And consistently, when these patients undergo surgery for overt clear cell kidney cancer, we also see um, pre-malignant cells that have lost VHL and have activated HIF pathways in the tumor adjacent kidney. And so if we can obtain samples from these patients, this should allow us to observe gene expression profiles um, of cells with inactivated VHL and observe how they change during the progression from pre-malignancy to malignancy. And so I'm just going to show you some very preliminary data from one patient today um, who, had, who has VHL syndrome and who was undergoing surgery for a very clear cell kidney cancer. And we did some single cell RNA sequencing on these samples. So from this patient, we got samples from two separate, um, very small early stage tumors. And although they're, they're both early stage, they're of different nuclear grades. And we also got some samples from the tumor adjacent, um, the tumor adjacent kidney. And uh, long story short, we don't think on this occasion we found pre-malignant lesions in the background kidney. And um, we, we do think we've got some really interesting data from these early malignant, um, malignant tumors. And this is essentially the next best thing. So this is just a snapshot of the data we've got from this one patient. And after filtering, we have data from approximately 18,900 individual cells. And um, this is just the snapshot of the data represented on a UMAP plot, where each dot represents the transcriptomic data from an individual cell. And if two cells are transcriptomically similar, they're placed together, um, close together on the plot. Whereas if two dots are far away, this means that the cells are transcriptomically different. And you can look at the genes that distinguish the different groups of cells. And this allows us to assign different cell types in our data. So we found that in our tumor samples, not only do we have um, our cancer cells, but we also have a wide range of different stromal cells and immune cells, which 
will be really interesting to analyze at some point. We can look, look at the difference, um, difference between different tumors and the interaction of the cancer cells with stromal cells. And then from the tumor um, adjacent kidney samples, we have a range of different expected epithelial cell types and also some non-epithelial cell types. So essentially this tells us that our technique is technically working well and it's sensitive enough to detect different subpopulations and potentially cell states. So we looked at the gene expression profiles of the two different tumors we have. And these are the same plots I showed you before, except each dot or cell is colored by the expression of a particular gene of interest. So the more blue a cell is, the higher the expression of your gene of interest. And I've highlighted the cancer cells from both of the tumors in red. And interest, as we would expect, we see activation of classical HIF target genes in, in the cancer cells from both of the tumors. So the classical HIF target genes I've shown here are C9 and VJFA. However, interestingly, some HIF target genes are activated in one of the tumors, and some HIF target genes are activated in the other tumor. And so this this is um, preliminary evidence for heterogeneity in the HIF pathway. And since the tumors are of different nuclear grades, this could represent um, adaptation of the HIF pathway as cells progress towards a more invasive phenotype. Not only can we look at the gene expression profiles of their cancer cells, but we also can look at some genetic information. So we've used a software called Infer CNV to look at chromosomal copy number variations in our samples. So I'm showing the results from the two separate tumors and um, in these plots, each row represents an uh, individual cell. And if you see a loss of signal at a chromosome that's represented in blue, and if you see gain of signal at a chromosome that represents red, that's represented by red. And so what we see is that chromosome 3P is lost in both of our tumours, and this is reassuring because this is the chromosome upon which VHL resides, and this is how, um, this is how VHL becomes completely inactivated in VHL syndrome associated clear cell kidney cancer. So not only is it um, useful that we're able to look at genetic information in cancer cells more generally, but we also think we can use chromosome, oh, I should also say that chromosome 3P loss cells when mapped onto the cell type specifically detect the cancer cells and not the stromal cells from the tumor sample. So we also think we can use chromosome 3P loss as a marker to distinguish malignant cells from stromal cells and then also potentially to help us identify pre-malignant cells in the future. So in summary, um, we have some preliminary data and we can see that um, we can successfully perform single cell RNA sequencing on both clear cell kidney cancer samples and tumor adjacent normal kidney samples. We can um, not only look at gene expression profiles of our cells, but we can also gain some genetic information from the cancer cells by looking for chromosomal copy number variations. And we think we can use chromosome 3P loss as a marker to help us distinguish malignant and potentially even pre-malignant cells going forward. And when we look at the gene expression profiles of the cancer cells from two separate tumors, we see um, potential heterogeneity in the HIF pathway in terms of HIF target genes between these tumors. And this could represent the HIF pathway adapting as tumors progress towards a more invasive phenotype. However, we do need to extend this analysis um, to more samples. And going forward, we think we're probably going to have to enrich for pre-malignant cells um, for example, by fact sorting, we're looking into options for some spatial transcriptomics where we're looking to, um, to isolate and characterize pre-malignant cells from tissue slides, tissue sections. And we're also looking to do some single cell ATAC seq to look at chromatin accessibility in single cells. And we hope that this will be able to um, enable us a more direct readout of the HIF pathway by looking at HIF genome binding sites. And I'll just say a, a very quick thank you to everyone involved in the work, especially David Mole, Ran Lee and Lisa Browning, and I'm happy to take any questions.
modern reader can take those uh, training samples and look at those synaptic dots of the brain for pathways and chip tape just to see how they might replicate you know, uh, different pathways during progression. I'm really sorry, I can't, I can't hear you very well. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, it's a bit better. Uh, okay, I'm just wondering whether you can use your system to dissect the differences between HIF-1 alpha versus HIF-2 alpha uh, by looking at chip 6 uh, by using those tissue samples you have. So you, you said is there differences between HIF-1 alpha and HIF-2 alpha? Is that in the, the cancer cells? Uh, in the pre-malignant versus malignant uh, clinic samples. Can you hear me? Sorry, the, the sound isn't very good quality. I'm sorry. Okay, let's, let's try the microphone. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, so uh, I'm just wondering whether you can uh, look at your pre-malignant versus malignant clinic samples to perform the uh, HIF-1 alpha chip sec versus HIF-2 alpha chip sec and try to dissect the probably distinctive role of these two subunits in the disease progression. Yeah, it's an interesting point. I think, unfortunately, um, I, I do have, have chip seek on cell lines, and I don't think we would have enough material to be able to do that on pre-malignant cells, unfortunately. Um, but it's an interesting point. It might be that we were, we'd be able to make some kind of primary cultures and um, look at HIF-1 and HIF-2 that way, but in clinical samples, I think the material isn't quite enough to do that. Can uh, we pass the microphone over to Dr. Genovese? Thank you. Um, very nice talk. Good question. Um, what is it? So if you look at other copy number alteration, like loss of 9P, and I think you also had loss of chromosome uh, or some material on chromosome 8, what is the um, fraction of clones with that alteration in uh, pre-malignant versus malignant? Um, so on, on this occasion, we, we weren't able to detect pre-malignant cells from this patient. Um, in terms of the clonality in the malignant cells, all copy number alterations look to be clonal. Um, but they are both early stage tumors, so it might be that, um, that that's why we don't see much heterogeneity and you see more branched evolution in later stage tumors. So you see loss of 9P also in early tumors? Oh, sorry, not 9P. Um, well, we've only, looked, we've only looked in the, these two tumors at the moment and um, we see actually not loss of 9P in this case, it's 9Q, which isn't a typical isn't a typical driver. So it could just be a reflection of genome instability in general. Um, okay, thank you. Dr. Lombardi, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, we have an online question for you from Dr. Karenikolas from Fox Chase. Uh, for the two patients, how is their VHL inactivated? Uh, if you have that data, missense mutation versus truncation versus epigenetic inactivation. And if it's a missense mutation, can you say what was the mutation? And we don't actually have, have that data yet. Um, we, we have some germline material from a normal kidney sample that we're planning to sequence, but we, ha we haven't yet got that information. Thank you. Perhaps one more question. This is very quick. Was that from the same patient? Was that all from one kidney, the samples? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. There's no difference between the two lesions. She said A and B. Is there a difference between the two lesions by histologically mean? Can she hear me? Olivia, oh, yes, yeah. Is there, a, is, there a, is there differences histologically between the two lesions? Yes, yes, there is actually. So it's it's quite interesting in the in one of the tumors, histologically, it has um, an extensive branched vasculature, and the other it doesn't have that. And in the tumor which has the extensive branched vasculature, we see higher expression of um, or a, more, a wider range of expression of pro-angiogenic factors. So. In both of the tumors, we see expression of VGFA 
but in the more vascularized tumor, we also see expression of PGF and HGF and some other potential factors that might be involved in angiogenesis. So it's interesting that the transcriptomes actually match up to the histology. I had a follow on question. So is the tumor adjacent tissue, was it much more similar to the tumor adjacent tumor or was it all the same? Like in other words, does it look as though the tumor that, that you see, the tumor adjacent tissue has similar, you know, UMAP patterns or, or anything like that? Um, the tumor adjacent tissue, it looks very distinct. So it actually, it, we can't see much, abnorm many abnormalities in it. We were hoping to cap some pre-malignant cells in there, which is why we, we sequenced quite a lot of it, but we don't think we captured any on this occasion. But yes, sir, they just, they're very distinct, very distinct. Um, and we think it looks like general healthy kidney tissue. Very good, thank you, Dr. Lombardi. <clears throat> Let me introduce our last speaker uh, for this session. Dr. Lily Wu is a professor uh, Department of Pharmacology and Urology, University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, and her title this morning, Dissecting the Periostin Directed Metastatic Crosstalk in Clear Cell Renal Cell Carcinoma. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, it's great uh, to share my findings uh, in person with you. And uh, I am sort of a new old investigator in the field because I joined this field probably about seven years ago. So I haven't met many of you. So this is very exciting for me to meet all of you in person. Um, so let me go ahead. Um, let me go ahead and for this short talk, let me go ahead and acknowledge all the key people who are doing this project. And in particularly, I like to acknowledge uh, Junhui Daniel Hu, my project scientist who really spearheaded this work and have collaborators uh, within UCLA and as well as uh, overseas uh, who started me on this project. And I have to particularly thank uh, Dr. Uh, Van Snick and uh, Pamit Jock for um, letting me use their monoclonal antibody uh, MPC5B4 for periostin. Um, as Dr. Lombardi mentioned, loss of VHL function is really truly a hallmark of CCRCC. But what we found is that the VHL protein expression is very heterogeneous uh, in each tumor. Um, as we have performed um, over 30 cases of VHL staining in our institution uh, in the last few years, uh, shown in the table on the right, uh, that um, including 10 cases at the bottom that are from surgical uh, samples from a single surgeon in a year. Uh, in this table, you can see that VHL positivity uh, is in the range of 20 to 60%, very heterogeneous in the primary tumor. And on the left, I show you two cases uh, that shows uh, clear heterogeneity in VHL protein with side-by-side -side VHL positive and VHL negative cells. Um, so to study this uh, impact of this VHL heterogeneity, uh, we generated uh, VHL deleted cells from three VHL positive RCC model, uh, the murine Renka, human ACHN, and a new uh, human uh, metastatic RCC primary cell model derived from our patient, uh, line number 22, case number 22 in the table before. So we mark uh, the VHL positive uh, parental cells with uh, red fluorescent protein and VHL negative cell, so-called VHL knockout cells with green fluorescent protein and luciferase to track them in vitro and in vivo. We plan implanted these tumor cells in the kidney of the mouse in three groups, the wild type alone group, the knockout cell alone group, or a combination of one-to-one -one, uh, mixture of these tumor cells. And this is shown in the right in the bioluminescent imaging of all these three groups of animal. The VHL wild type group has um, tumor growing uh, in the left kidney very robustly. The VHL knockout tumors don't grow at all. And when you combine one to one, you have very significant mixture of tumor growing and uh, metastasis in the lung shown in the animal. So um, detailed histological uh, anatomical and histological analysis show 
Bowman and metastasis in the um, uh, large metastatic lesion in the lungs of the mixed tumor uh, compared to the EHL wild type tumor as shown in this slide. And um, detailed histology again show these very fulminant metastases uh, in the mixed tumor compared to the um, wild type tumor bearing mice. So what is going on here? Let me revisit this. As Dr. Lombardi has shown previously, the uh, uh, loss of VHL uh, lead to upregulation of uh, HIF pathways. And, and particularly, we believe that uh, HIF1 alpha is uh, leading to uh, growth, slowing down of the growth, um, poorly proliferative uh, in the VHL knockout cells. And uh, these uh, loss of VHL also induce ENT and motility in the knockout cells. Uh, and these knockout cells also overexpress nu numeral soluble factors. So in our system, we clearly see that the VHL knockout cells are the metastatic driver. Um, in summary, they are promoting the growth of VHL uh, wild type cells and inducing EMT and motility of the wild type cells here. These are summarized in the, in the picture here. Um, so, um, to study this uh, really in detail, we perform uh, this analysis to look at the crosstalk between these two cells. Uh, in this co-culture of VHL uh, wild type cells in red and VHL knockout cells in green, you can see that on the, this time-lapse microscopy, the wild, wild type cells move very slowly. The knockout cells uh, close the gap very fast. Uh, when you uh, combine these two cells together, clearly the VHL knockout cells are promoting the motility of the VHL wild type cells. And here is a quantification of these, uh, how VHL cell, knockout cells are promoting the motility of uh, the VHL wild type cells. Next, we believe that soluble factors are clearly promoting this enhancement as shown here, the left again, the wild type cells uh, culture alone and the right with the addition of condition media from uh, knockout cells. It also promoted the motility of these cells. Um, so next uh, we perform uh, RNA sequencing study that was uh, published in um, 2016 uh, from the knockout cell to uh, trying to identify metastatic driver genes. And we show that uh, a set of four genes are upregulated, uh, including periosin here. And uh, these are all HIF1 regulated uh, genes. And in, com in combination, the upregulation of these four genes lead to significant uh, poor uh, patient survival. So what is periostin? Uh, periostin is also known as osteoblast specific factor two. It's a secreted stromal protein that is involved in bone and cardiac development. Uh, it's overexpressed in the VHL knockout cells and known to upregulate in hypoxia and EMT. Uh, overexpression of, in RCC is a very poor prognostic indicator as shown in the graph on the left. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it actually mediated uh, lots of integrant uh, dependent cell adhesion uh, interaction uh, with stromal uh, collagen and fibronectin as shown uh, with these fasciculum uh, domains or integrant uh, dependence interactions. So what we found is that periotins secreted by VHL knockout cells increase the motility and EMT of VHL wild type cells. And they also turn around and actually induce uh, vascular leak by endothelial cell destruction. I won't have time to show you all the data, but this is a summary of the effect. And clearly when we use the monoclonal antibody to block VHL, uh, uh, block the VHL induced motility of uh, wild type cells, you can see the addition of uh, the anti-periostin uh, antibody uh, decreased the uh, motility enhancement here. 
So next we treat uh, using a treatment model in the mouse again. Uh, the slides are missing a lot of marking, I'm sorry. Uh, but actually uh, it's the same uh, mixture tumor uh, injected into the kidney. And clearly with the uh, antibody treatment, the left group is uh, control and the right group is with the monoclonal antibody. Uh, we see that the primary tumor is not significantly affected with the treatment with monoclonal antibody, but the metastasis on the lower histology, you can see that is dramatically reduced uh, compared to the left uh, to the right. Uh, so the metastatic lesion is dramatically reduced. So the take home message here, we believe that um, periostin is a mediator of cooperative metastasis. BHL deletion induced BMT, increased motility and secreted factors, uh, and slow the proliferation of BHL knockout cells. The metastasis uh, in our model really require co cooperation between BHL negative and BHL positive cells. And we believe the BHL uh, negative or knockout cells are the metastatic drivers. And the BHL knockout cells uh, promote the growth in EMT uh, of uh, BHL positive wild type cells. And HIF1 upregulated uh, periostin is the mediator of this metastatic crosstalk. Um, and the periostin induced cell migrations and vascular destruction. And we believe it's a promising new therapeutic target in metastatic RCC. Thank you. Um, can I? Thank you. Very nice talk. Um, quick question. I don't know if you tried that experiment. If you co-inject isogenic line that are VHL wild type and VHL knockout, and you look at metastatic dissemination, what is the dynamic of metastatic dissemination? What metastasize? Uh, are the VHL knockout pulling with them the wild type? What, what, what do you see? I mean, we, you have the two colors to, to check we, those, we, right? We did that experiment. Very interestingly, I don't have the data with me, but what you see, um, so exactly what you did, we look at sampling the cells from the mouse early on, very early on, uh, one day, two, day, week two, three, four, something like that. I remember. So what you see, the first cells to escape are the green ones. Very little, the first cell to get in the circulation. And then compared to the wild type tumor, you start to see the red cells coming on later. And if you just compare it to the tumors of the wild type tumor alone, you also see some cells in the circulation. But what you see with the mixed tumor is that you see a tremendous, tremendous escalation of the red cells into the circulations. Tremendous numbers compared to the wild type. So that's the experiment show. Question yes. in the back. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Abhishek? Yeah. Uh, sorry. I had a question about the models themselves. Uh, so basically, uh, 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 the, the Renka cells are not a classical clear cell RCC. Uh, similarly, I mean, Ari's work uh, in the past has shown that ACHN actually doesn't cluster typically with a CCRCC sort of a state. And so we know that VHL biology is very different in non-CCRCC versus CCRCC cells. And so the question would be, uh, although the findings are provocative, would you be able to go back to a more bona fide CCRCC model and do a reintroduction of VHL and ask in that context whether there is any crosstalk between the VHL profession and VHL deficiency? I think that's a very interesting and excellent question, and we're trying to do that. But remember, every single model has some of their own particulars. And I'm not saying that this is exactly the right model, that's exactly the right model, because I think every model has missing something in this. And you can also attribute, for instance, 7860 is missing HIF1. So how can you answer that question clearly? unless you engineer all of those pieces together. And we are in the process of doing that, sort of re-engineer everything, 
take it out, bring it back one piece by one piece. But a lot of that work has been done in the past. It, essentially, I think there is a differential effect of one on the other. And I think I don't see them all going at the same time. And they seem to coordinate and work with each other. And in our model, I think it may be in different cells too. So that creates a problem when you're trying to do a lot of whole tumor or even single cell analysis. It just, it's hard to, to, to disintegrate and dissociate all of that information together. Just, just my point of caution. Bobby? Yeah, just a quick question. It seems the metastasis are very organ specific. Yes, very yeah. lung specific. Okay. A lot of them, um, including models that we've seen that we generated back from the primary model, which is a CCRCC model, then um, uh, we see a more lung specific metastasis. Do they metastasize to any other organs? And what is the dependence on periosteum? Uh, actually, we do see some in the liver, but, um, and we also see in the chicken as well, it follows the same way, so whatever that means. Uh, but anyway. One last quick question from online. Um, do you have any information about the change in the extracellular matrix composition? Um, we're actively investigating that. I think it's very interesting. The only main uh, component of extracellular matrix, we haven't do the matrix, but the stromal components and um, all of that is the endothelial component. It seems like it's very uh, uh, leaky and vascular in our model for promoting metastasis. Is there a question you. here in the middle? Hello. Hi, Hi Hedda. Just a, a kind of a thought, a question here. Um, the notion that if you have these VHL wild type cells that are present in the context of what we understand as a VHL null environment. So could these VHL wild type cells have some other tumor initiating components, you know, some other pro-tumor genetic factor that enables it to bypass? What I'm, what I'm trying to say is that our understanding of clear cell renal cell carcinoma is that it's initiated by VHL loss. And by virtue of these cells having retained VHL, could they have some other driver that we're not aware of that is driving this other phenotype that you're seeing? Yeah, I, this model really, uh, for us to really look at a late event. And I think to understand the VHL biology is certainly very, very complex to going back to the initiation step, what happened to what however one copy, two copy. This is a whole progression that I don't think our model is uh, able to answer at all. And um, I think Dr. Lombardi's model is much better at answering that. We're really looking at one time point. So um, I would say that I, I really cannot comment on it, but all of these lines that we generated are already oncogenic in some ways. So whatever it is, they have already progressed to uh, cancerous stage. Great. Thank you very much to uh, our speakers. Thank you very much. <laughs>